Hi guys, Suze here. We're going to be talking about drench resistance today. How to drench effectively while still protecting the products that we have available to us so they don't just stop working. Please support me by subscribing to the channel on YouTube and I'll see you in a sec. Hello everyone, thanks for checking in for another episode of Suze the Vet. I am Suze. So today we're going to be talking about drench resistance and I'm thinking if you've already clicked on this you either already have a diagnosis of drench resistance on your land or you're one of the few awesome people that are being proactive about preventing it. It is a big deal, it's scary and we do need to be talking about it and educating ourselves. So thanks for being here, we're going to go over what it is, how to prevent it and how to deal with it once you've got it. Now if by chance you are new to the term, drench resistance essentially means that the parasitic worms that live inside your animals have evolved to outsmart the deworming drenches that we have available to us to use. Goats are particularly really, really high risk. If you have goats, you have to know what you're doing in this area or you're going to run into issues. They have evolved to browse plants up high off the ground where there are just no gut worm larvae. The gut worm larvae are all waiting down the bottom of the pasture. So goats have not evolved any resilience at all against internal parasites. Other animals, sheep, cattle, horses, over about a year and a half, a sheep or a cow should be more or less out of the woods. Not so with goats, they are high risk year round for life, my friends. Right, so diarrhea, losing weight, not responding to the drenches, this is what we're looking for. Of course, there are many different causes of diarrhea and weight loss that are not due to intestinal worms and common causes as well, like trace element deficiencies, infectious disease. So you will need to get a vet to help you diagnose drench resistance, don't just do it presumptively. But here's what you can do to prevent it from occurring in the first place. So to break it down, our big key areas are one, reduce the amount of parasite larvae on the pasture waiting to be taken in by the animal. Two, reduce the amount of larvae the animal is actually physically eating. Three, reduce stress on the animal so that they can deal with the burdens that they're carrying better. Four, drench strategically. Do not drench your whole flock preventatively without having an issue. We need to be monitoring so that we're only drenching when necessary. So to break this down into practical steps for you, do not let your goats and young animals graze down lower than three centimetres. Goats actually prefer to eat high up off the ground, about seven centimetres plus. So your goats can be offered tree leaves, hay, other browsing materials. Do have a quick Google search so you're not giving them anything toxic. They are not selective about it. But basically the massive majority of parasite larvae sit right down in the bottom two to three centimetres of pasture. So prevent these animals, your goats and your young animals, from grazing down hard and straight off the bat you're going to cut way back on the number of larvae that they're taking in as well as making sure that your young growing animals are the ones getting the nice long nutritious creme de la creme crop because they're the ones that need to grow. If you do find yourselves pushed for grass, bring in some hay or silage from off farm to feed them, which will keep them from grazing down hard. Now there are actually plenty of people out there that will remove their animals from the pasture, often goats, and keep them indoors on brought in food during the high risk seasons because they're so high risk. Of course, sheep are particularly sneaky at not wanting to try new food, so it can take them a little bit to learn that they can actually eat hay or silage, and no, it's not laced with arsenic. If possible, try to spell your pasture, and that just means resting your pasture. So rest a paddock, keep the flock off it for more than three months. Now this is gonna reduce the parasite load on the pasture. There are absolutely parasites that can hunker down and survive for a year or more. So the longer you can spell it, the better. And by spell, I mean spell it from that species. You can cross graze with other species, of course, but not just any species, which leads me to my next point cross grazing. Now this is going to be your best friend to keep parasites low naturally. Sheep, goats and alpaca share the same species of parasites that is not cross grazing between these species. If these three species are sharing pasture they will be amplifying the load for each other. They all share the same parasites. Cattle and deer share their own parasites which are different to the small ruminants. Horses are different again, okay? Pigs are different again, birds are different again. So you want to cross graze between these sets of species. And by cross graze, I mean run the cattle through the paddock. They're gonna pick up the sheep parasites and kill them for us because the sheep parasite can't thrive inside a cow. And then we run the sheep through after. The sheep are gonna pick up the cattle parasites and kill them for us. Does that make sense? Jump over and check out my other video. I do have another one specifically on cross grazing. It can be a little bit confusing, but you'll get your head around it. And something that may be a bit more useful for you is you can actually cross graze between age groups of the same species. So by about 18 months old, a grazing animal tends to build up a certain level of resilience. Goats, less so, to be honest, even adults 
are pretty susceptible to illness for worms as we've already mentioned. So what you want to do is separate your weaned young growing animals that are still under a year and a half old and have them go through the paddock first. The adults come through behind them. So the young ones will eat the tops off the long pasture where there are less parasites and then the grown ups come in behind them and take the brunt of the parasite low which is down low. And these parasites are just going to sit inside the adults and not do a whole lot. Now the worst thing you could do would be to have just young animals on the same piece of land year round. Carving or lambing in the paddocks where you've just been raising your young weaned animals is a terrible idea and we run into big issues. Now different animals want to eat grass at different lengths so there can be a fair bit of strategy behind rotational grazing of different species. As I say, I have done another episode on it specifically on cross grazing if you haven't already subscribe and check that out. Okay, so strategy number six, and this one is crucial, maybe I should have opened with it. Preventative drenching the whole flock to prevent parasites should not be a thing anymore. This isn't okay anymore. Once you've got resistance there, you're done. It's very difficult to get back again. So please, the better option is not to get to that place to start with. We need to be strategic about our drench use to limit it as much as possible. And that is by using fig lead counts. Now this is a test just by using a small poo sample from each animal. It's cheap, you drop it into the counter at your local vet and they're gonna tell you if the animal has a high enough burden that warrants to be drenched. Now I personally recommend testing every six weeks in those under a year old, otherwise every four weeks during summer in warm areas that are prone to barber's pole, like us here in Auckland, once in autumn and then if anyone starts scouring or looking pale in the gums or the conjunctiva. Now the alternative to fecal lead counts is just drenching selectively for anyone that has poor weight gain, scouring or looking pale in the gums and conjunctiva. You want to ensure good nutrition so there is no extra stress on the animal and get onto treatment of diseases as early as possible. Any extra stress on them is going to make them less likely to be able to deal with the burden. Carrying some parasites is actually very normal, it's all about making sure that the body can deal with that burden happily. And last but not least, the ability to deal with parasite burdens happily does actually have a genetic basis to it. So breeding for resilient animals is becoming more of a focus on studs and culling those that become sickly from worms really easily is a logical option. Of course, it's often emotionally not an option if we're dealing with pet sheep loved for their individuality. So that may or may not be for you, but it's important for you to know that is an option. Okay guys, that's my ramble for now. There is more that we can do if you develop drench resistance to try and revert your flock or herd back to non-resistant worms. Um, but that's going to be on an individual farm basis so find a vet you trust and work one-on-one -on -one with them to formulate a plan but this should be an awesome starting point for everyone so just to sum up we have graze your young animals and goats above three centimeters feed supplementary feed at high risk times of year spell your pasture for at least three months up to 12 months if you can cross graze between species and between age classes strategic use of drenching keep good nutrition and stress low and breed for resilient animals Thanks again for watching. Please do share this video. This is something that we need to be talking more about and education is key. Don't forget to jump over and subscribe. See you later.